a little complicated, and I'm certainly no expert on it, but basically what happens is um, you set aside 20% of the units in the building for affordable. They cannot be set aside on the back of the building or the bottom of the building. They have to be sprinkled throughout the building. There's all sorts of rules so that and they don't appear in any way different than other units. And you may save a little bit on kitchen appliances and things of that nature. They're typically a little bit smaller. You have to make them available to, um, uh, they have to be available to people who make, I think, 35% of the household median income in America. And the, the difficult part about that in New York is 35% of, of household income in America is practically a poverty line in New York. So, you know, it's sometimes difficult to fill them, but basically you end up with teachers and actors and artists and, um, you know, hotel workers and, and, um, and they mix in just fine with, with, the, uh, with the market rate. What the, the architects? Exactly. The deal, the, 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 deal, the deal is that we get, um, we get access to uh, um, HUD bonds, bond capacity that HUD puts in each state. So you get uh, relatively tax-exempt bonds to finance your project. You can finance basically about 90% of the project, so you don't have much equity in. Then from the city of New York, you get a 20-year real estate tax abatement, and that's against the whole building. So when you take the real estate tax abatement and you take you know, tax exempt financing for 90%, all of a sudden the numbers start to make sense. Now you can't pay more in New York terms than about $200 a square foot for the land, for the performative work, and it's very hard to find land at that price. So what we typically do, and what we will be doing in the yards, is we do hybrids. So we do condos on top, 80-20s in the bottom. So this sort of argument say, say the land is $300 a foot, so we do condos, the land goes in the condo at $400 a foot, the land goes in the rentals at $200 a foot. We don't really like condos because it's, it's ordinary income, you sell it and then they're gone. We love the rentals, but you gotta make the numbers work. The, the secret sauce is the real estate tax abatement, and not every city does it, but when you think about what the city's trying to accomplish, they're trying to produce housing stock, and they're trying to produce affordable housing stock. So where there was no stock once before, what does it matter if you're not getting the tax increment from the new market rate housing because you had nothing there before? So, um, and what we do, a little different than other developers, is we actually market the market rate housing as luxury. I mean, it's not middle class housing with lower income, it's luxury housing with lower income people in the building and you don't even know who they are. And you know, we get 80 bucks a foot. We, we, we can do better in the residential market than you can do in the commercial office market. Um, but the, and then the last thing we do, and again, I think it's kind of unique to us, Stephen Ross is a huge believer in floating rate debt. So we take those bonds and we get it insured by Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and we let it float. And so it's a natural hedge. If they, you know, in, in the post 9-11, we had apartments in, in um, Battery Park, you know, people were fleeing. So vacancy rose, but interest rates were nothing. You know, same thing in uh, 07, 08, when the recession hit, vacancy grew a little bit, but our interest rates went down. So our, our, our average interest rate on our portfolio is around 1%. And uh, so, and that's a natural hedge. As interest rates go up, chances are you can raise the rent on your market uh, rate housing. It's a fantastic program. Um, We've not been able to see any flaws in it. I think it's a model that every city should think about. It, it really is a great way to build rental housing, as opposed to building condos, selling them in mass, and then hoping the investors don't rent them out. The only thing I'll add, the difference between Manhattan and Toronto is the flexibility that the city has to offer incentives and breaks and tips and you know all these other tools, which has created all the wars from one city to the other which we uh, can't do. And nor are our cities necessarily equipped to do it with you know, financial engineering and other things. So it's a, it starts in the city and then it goes from there. That's how it all goes. That, the, this project has been city-led. The, the MTA, as you may know, is a state agency, but, and they own the air rights. They just want, they just want to get a billion dollars into their capital program. The city is the one that's leading the charge. And the extension of the subway was critically important. So the city created a development agency called Hudson Yards Development Corporation, which actually sold bonds, they're essentially TIF bonds, to pay for the subway. So that they could say to the, they, they didn't want to go to the MTA and say, why don't you build the subway to Hudson Yards and have the MTA say, well, we're still trying to you know, redo the Sunnyside Yards or we got problems on Second Avenue Subway. They didn't, we didn't want to get 
hung up in the capital program of the MTA. So the city went to the MTA and said, we will pay you to build a subway for us, and we've got the money, and, and you can't use it for anything else, but it's our money. And that has been hugely effective, so that the HYDC, who led the rezoning, led the EIS, is paying for the infrastructure, and is really on top of it. And it's, it's similar to the model of Battery Park. The difference is it's city-led this time, whereas it used to be state-led. And that's, that's, I think, it's a change that's occurred in New York over the last 10, 10 to 15 years, where even though the state has the power, it's lost the, kind of the will to do it. And the city doesn't have the power, but one has the will. I think it's important to know, Battery Park City was, 60, was the 64 acres of dirt that was excavated out of the World Trade Center that created that piece of land. And the infrastructure came to it first, and that project did work. Canary Wharf didn't work. Part of it was a liquidity crisis because Brakemans had debt against their public stock, which was liquid, and they had their cash tied up in it, and they couldn't get it out. But, but largely because the infrastructure wasn't in place, and they were waiting for the infrastructure to arrive, and it was beyond their control. And I think a fundamental difference between this project and Battery Park City, we hope and trust and pay and pray, is that that, that prior investment has been made and nobody's waiting and there isn't the same level of disbelief and there isn't the same level of lack of control. Well, it, it, it has, it has, it's a function of timing and, uh, and, and they were ahead of their game. Now it's a sensation, but you've got to find the way to stay at the table and their vision was so big and um, they, the, the, the city didn't move as quickly as the Rankins and, and the, uh, the developers needed to move. And that was strengthened for a period of time. Today it's sensational. We are, we're pretty confident that every building will go as a neighborhood development goes. So I think we'll be one of the, the first certified neighborhood, lead certified NDs in the country, mostly because of the transit. Um, we, the cogen is designed, uh, it's really tri-gen, so we, we use the excess heat from the cogen to give us domestic hot water uh, for all of the residential buildings. So it's coming back to the phasing, it's a little difficult. So in the early years, we may have cogen that's producing a little, excess, a little excess heat, but when we're fully built up, the cogen size, so that all the heat is recaptured and, and used for either heating or domestic hot water in the complex. We are investigating, um, I'm spending a lot of time on a centralized waste management system. Um, you know, a little bit like the, the model that went into Roosevelt Island 30 plus, 40 years ago. Um, it hasn't changed much over time, but it's, uh, it's cool, but it you know, requires a fair bit of capital up front. In our $800 million uh, land budget per debt, uh, we're carrying a placeholder of $50 million for what we call Hudson Yards Infrastructure Corporation, and we're just, in the early stages of trying to determine what that business plan is. But the idea there is to uh, make the complex, one, as sustainable as possible, but two, really lower the operating costs through scale for all of the occupants. And, and one of the big benefits there is this mix of zoning because the, the low demand of office and residential is very complementary to each other. So um, we hope that they will be able to really utilize that. The other thing that um, actually David Miller pointed out to me recently, and he said Obama's talking about all these green jobs, and we all have an image of um, wind farms and the rest. He said when you build a fully integrated mixed-use development, and people live there, and they work there, and they have their free time there, and they're not driving places, and you create a community that's environmentally friendly, isn't, isn't that a green job? Like in some ways, isn't that the future, and aren't those the jobs you want to create? And I thought, I thought it was a, an interesting point, and it's, I don't think he's far off. Yeah, but these people still have coffee cups, and it's like the diapers that grow up. I mean, like, how are we dealing with these massive amounts of waste that often is treated as an asset on the city's Well, I don't think it's an afterthought in New York's mind. I mean, Plan NYC, which Dan Dockroff led, is a hugely ambitious uh, project on, on the sustainable city and how to grow the city. And I think uh, Edward Glaser's recent book on you know, the, the, the triumph of the city, I mean, we're all trying to deal with the issues, and I think there's various solutions in various places, but I think that it's top of everybody's mind. If you're, if you're really interested, uh, Yorkdale, we just put in a new food court, 
and our people studied it for two years, we cut the waste back by, I think it's like 88%. And part of it's uh, real plates, part of it's knives, forks, part of it's real, you know, all those things. And the efficiency and the thought behind it has been, been pretty incredible. And I, I can't, I don't have the, uh, I'm not up to speed on the details, but it can be done, and uh, that's a good point. Any questions on this? Toronto aren't as high as our revenues. And let me assure you, your costs are nowhere near as high as our costs. So yeah, when you look at the pro forma, we're, we're looking at the same yields that you're looking at here. Um, and so I, I think that the it's not an issue, an issue of cost. It's more, um, you, you know, location still matters. And so you can't put retail everywhere. Um, one of the, one of the, we think retail is the key to successful mixed-use projects or large integrated projects. We believe fundamentally in the retail component, but it can't just go everywhere. And um, so why, why did it work so well in Time Warner's case? Because there isn't any retail on the west side. Um, and everybody said, Time, well, you know, you didn't come hoops. Don't you know retail doesn't work on the west side? There's no retail on the west side. Well, <laughs> There's people living on the west side, they don't shop, and so it's an outstanding success because we fill the void. And the same thing with where we are in Hudson Yards, you know, Manhattan, Manhattan has 10 square feet of retail per person, and we think of Manhattan as being a very, very heavily retailed space because when you go to visit Manhattan, you go to Madison Fifth Avenue, but, you know, if you go up to 115th Street in Harlem, there's not that much retail. Um, so what happens is that it's only 10 square feet per person in Manhattan, there's 25 to 30 square feet per person in the U.S. So that gives you a direct comparison. Then you go to the west side of Manhattan, everybody living west of 8th Avenue, from Columbus Circle down to Tribeca, uh, to the river, that's our, that's our neighborhood. 400,000 people, household, in, household medium income, $116,000 a year, and there's five square feet of retail per person. And it's lousy retail. So that's why you, it's, it's, it's the right, it is the secret sauce, but the location and the demographics become hugely, hugely important. And that's where I would, that's where I would focus the, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna spend a little extra, that's where I'd spend it. Four 11 really one of the best retail components in the country, all the way around. So the urbanists come along and say, oh, it's horrible. Like they, they complain about County Wars retail on the ground. It works. Now, one of the reasons why it works is it's pitched properly. So it's not, you know, I think they learned, as we all do, and we did a Time Warner too, you can't pitch too high. You've got to pitch to what we call uh, bridge, bridge, bridge to luxury, not luxury. Because, you know, we, we get caught up in thinking that the CEO is just going to dash downstairs and buy a diamond necklace for his wife's birthday. That doesn't sustain the retail. Boots does, or Dwayne Reed, but then that's a little too low. So, you know, J. Crew, that's what really does it. You know, we, we've got the highest performing J. Crew store in the country, the highest performing um, Hugo Boss store in the country, the highest performing Aline Fisher store in the country. That's, that's, that's the secret sauce. And uh, so you've got to have the right retailers, the right mix, and the right... <laughs> and the, I think there's a misconception that we go through this all the time with our tenants. They think we're going to build a platform like a table, and then on top of the table we can put anything we want. And that's not the way we build it. The foundations for the building go to bedrock, and they go right down in between the tracks. If a track is in the way, then we have to make a, you know, an accommodation. You have to span the foundation. So when you build all the buildings, which is 50% of the site, the ground floor of the buildings is, in effect, the platform. The platform in between the buildings, the open space, is kind of the easy part. It's got to support four or five feet of dirt and stone, but it's no big deal. It's on a very good structural grid. So it's the most basic of, of uh, construction technologies. We drill caissons where we're allowed to. These would be the track layout, which doesn't necessarily coincide with where the building columns want to be. Um, and then we stand steel on the caissons, and we built a steel deck, and we've debated whether it's a precast deck or a concrete on a steel deck, but it's, and you just go chunk, 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 chunk. It's pretty, pretty yes. basic. Young and, young and Bloor's built over active trains. Grand Central Station's built over active trains. I mean, if you, if you picture it that way. All Park Avenue's over active trains. Yeah. Um, they don't currently have it like in the sidewalk and you can tap into it, but they have no problem delivering the power. It either comes from, I think, Gramsci Park or, or 42nd Street. We'll have, we'll have uh, at least two substations serving us, and then we have multiple uh, points of entry in the complex. We have six points of entry into the eastern yards and probably another six points of entry into the western yards. The city is ripping up the streets as we speak to put more utilities in, but that, it's all pretty much in the long-term Manhattan plan. Uh, no, we don't take that into account.
the same <laughs> answer. No, I think that the useful life of a building is 40 to 50 years. And if you do a long-term pro forma as a developer, you expect to spend the same dollars between 40 and 50 years as it costs you to build it in the beginning. So for example, Commerce Court West, which was built for $150 million, when it was rehabbed 40 years later, it cost $150 million. So same dollar to dollar. So my guess is 50 years from now, if that's costing us a billion dollars, you're going to have to rationalize go forward rents with that kind of reinvestment. Now, you know, and um, so that's that's the way certainly we look at it. Your useful life of any hard assets 40 to 50 years.